Few vehicles are as iconic or as iconically American as the Jeep Wrangler. The Wrangler origin story dates all the way back to 1941 with the original World War II Jeep. Civilian sales started in 1944, that's where we get the CJ name, Civilian Jeep, from, and it's been known as the Wrangler since 1986. For 2024, it's received a bit of a refresh, helping keep this current with the new crop of off-road SUVs that don't date back quite as far as the original Wrangler does. Let's dive in and see, is the Wrangler still the one to get, or should you be taking a look at a Bronco or perhaps waiting for the upcoming Toyota 4Runner. 2024 brings more than just fresh new looks to the Wrangler. We also get improved off-road capability with sturdier axles available in the back, improved towing capability, bigger LCDs inside, and this is the first time the Wrangler has ever had side curtain airbags. We also get the availability of an onboard 3.6 kilowatt inverter if you want to tackle the Rubicon Trail and take your refrigerator and your microwave with you. Now let's talk about the look. Obviously we have a different grill up front, but it's a classic Jeep 7 slot grill. They've reduced the height of the grill a little bit because we now have the availability of an 8,000 pound factory winch up front. Interesting twist, not all Wranglers are gonna get LED headlights. They are gonna be standard in the top end trims, but the base models will still have halogen headlights. Fog lights are standard down here, but they also change depending on the trim that you get. Other than that, the structure of the Wrangler up front is pretty similar to before. We have the turn signals and running lights over here on the side. We still have the available three-part metal front bumper with the recovery hooks, blue of course, because this is the plug-in hybrid version. The Wrangler continues to be America's best-selling convertible, and this is my favorite convertible top. It's basically a big canvas sunroof that power opens all the way to the rear. But if you want a hard top or a traditional convertible soft top, obviously those are available still on the Wrangler. You can get it in four-door or two-door formats still for 2024. Of course, the doors come off and the windshield still folds down, which is something that you don't get in the Bronco. The only real change from the side view is that the antenna has now been integrated into the windshield, and yes, it does work when the windshield is folded down, so you don't have that whip antenna over there on the other side. Out back, the changes are mostly functional. We get a towing capacity increase to 5,000 pounds if you properly equip your Wrangler. That would be with the 3.6 liter engine or the 2 liter turbo. If you get the plug-in hybrid or the 6.4 liter V8, you actually get a lower towing capacity number. We also get a new axle in the back if you get the Rubicon versions. It's a full float Dana 44 axle. That was a somewhat common aftermarket switch, so Jeep decided to do this right from the factory. Full float axles get an extra set of bearings on the inside to help improve durability, off-road capability, and of course, payload capacity, which is part of how we get to the higher towing ability. Everything under the hood carries over from last year. The base engine is a 3.6 liter V6 producing 285 horsepower. It's the only engine to choose if you want the manual transmission, although most folks are probably gonna get the eight speed automatic. Then we have a two liter turbo that produces a little bit less power, 270, but more torque, 295 pound-feet. It's gonna give you pretty similar fuel economy as well, 24 miles per gallon in most trims. If you want electric range, and a lot of folks seem to because sales of the plug-in hybrid system are about 40% of all Wrangler volume in the United States, making this the best-selling plug-in hybrid in America. This plug-in hybrid system will give you 375 horsepower, 470 pound-feet of torque, so certainly improved performance over the V6 and the two-liter turbo on its own. On the downside, it's not gonna give you better fuel economy if you don't plug it in. This is rated for 20 miles per gallon average versus 24 in most trims of the Wrangler with the two liter turbo alone. It does, however, give you 21 miles of electric range and of course, 470 pound-feet of torque for off-road duty. So there are really two different reasons to get the plug-in hybrid system. You want the electric range or you want the extra power and the extra torque. Of course, if you want 470 pound-feet of torque and absolutely the best sounding entry in this off-road segment, then you want the model with the 6.4 liter Hemi V8 that is still gonna be available for 2024. And that's gonna bump you up to 470 horsepower power. On the downside, it's going to drop your fuel economy down to 17 miles per gallon. It's also available only in the most expensive versions of the Wrangler and the most capable versions that would of course be the Wrangler Rubicon 392. Jeep has retained the exterior hood latches, a bit of nostalgia that I appreciate, but these hood vents in the 4xE trims are purely decorative. They aren't actually doing anything. If you get the two-door Wrangler, you have the choice of two engines, the V6 or the two-liter turbo without the plug-in hybrid system. If you want the plug-in hybrid or the 6.4, you have to get the four-door Wrangler. And if you want the 6.4, you can only get it in the Rubicon trim. 
The 4xe, on the other hand, this drivetrain has expanded out to a number of different trims now. The Sport S trim is going to be the least expensive way to get the 4xe system. We then have the Willys, the Sahara, high altitude, and of course, this Rubicon trim. But Jeep has also changed the way you'll buy a 4xe depending on where you are in the United States. If you live in California or one of the other states that follows California's ZEV rules, there are about 13 of them or so, then the 4xe models are going to be the only ones stocked in dealer inventory. So if you want to be able to roll to your Jeep dealer and just buy a Wrangler right off the lot today, it's probably going to be a 4xe. You can of course order any of the drivetrains if you want, including the 6.4 liter V8. Conversely, if you live outside of one of those states and you want a 4xe, you're not going to find that in dealer inventory. You'll roll down and you'll find the rest of the drivetrain lineup, and then you can order a 4xe if you want one. We don't know what the lead times are going to be on those other models, but obviously Jeep is producing every drivetrain in the lineup, so it's probably not going to be too long to just snag whatever drivetrain you want. You just won't be able to get it that exact day. The reason for the divide is actually pretty logical, although Jeep won't actually talk directly about it. This is the most popular plug-in hybrid in America. About 40% of all Wranglers in 2023 are going to be this plug-in hybrid model. And obviously, Wrangler sales in states like California, Oregon, Washington, etc. have skewed very heavily towards the 4xe anyway. And in some other states, the 4xe hasn't been quite as popular. So they're really prioritizing production for the places where the 4xe was most popular. There are also logically some future legislative reasons that Stellantis is going to need to focus more on the 4xe system because plug-in hybrids are going to be required theoretically at some point in California, but those rules have not started. So this is simply Chrysler or Jeep or whatever you want to call this corporation, moving production around where customers are actually interested in the vehicles. Going forward, the plug-in hybrid system is likely going to be the most popular drivetrain in the Wrangler, so let's talk a bit more about that. It does come with a level 1 EVSC, so you can charge just off of 120 volts. This is probably going to be fine for most folks out there. You can completely charge the battery in approximately 15 hours or so. This is an about 17 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack on board. It's not the largest battery out there. And that's why we get just 21 miles of electric range. But for folks out there that are maybe debating, do I really want the plug-in hybrid system or not, there is an additional factor, which is this little breakout box. So if you plan on doing a lot of overlanding, camping, etc., with your Jeep, and you can't live without power, if I could take this rubber section off, you can get this breakout box in the base trims. It's going to be standard in the upper end trims of Wrangler. It allows 3.6 kilowatts of off-board power inversion. This is basically just a smart extension cord box. We have two different 15 amp circuits in here. I am surprised that there's no 240 volt outlet. And then you simply plug it right there into the J1772 connector. We then have a 20 foot cord so you can take your power to your tent or wherever you might need it. The vehicle will operate in a few different ways. You can operate it in hybrid mode where it's going to keep the battery charged to a particular level, so acting essentially as a generator with a battery backup plan, or you can let it just drain the battery down and then turn off whenever the battery has reached a particular lower level. If you want, for instance, to just camp out for weeks on end, you'll definitely have a lot of power capability right here offboard, and you'll even be able to run maybe some smaller air conditionings if you have a tiny camper out back. Now, rather unfortunately, you cannot just buy this as an accessory and use it with your 2023 Wrangler 4xe, and that's because the hardware on board has actually changed a little bit for 2024. All the inversion for AC power is done on board with the onboard inverter module in a bi-directional format. So this is not a universal device. Every manufacturer out there that is doing this kind of off-board power is going in a slightly different direction. So you also cannot plug this into a Ford Lightning or a Silverado EV or a Kia EV6 or anything like that, and neither can you use those adapters on the Jeep. You have to use the Jeep box and you have to have a 2024 Wrangler 4xe. Aside from the big LCD in the dash, the other big change in here is the availability of a power seat for the first time. This I think is a good example of competition really bringing out the best for everybody, because honestly, without the Bronco and its power seats and side curtain airbags, we might never have gotten them in the Wrangler. This is a multi-way power driver seat and power front passenger seat with four-way adjustable lumbar support, and it is by far the most comfortable seat that's ever been in a Wrangler. I actually prefer this general seat design to the Bronco because the seat bottom cushion is a little bit longer, and I do find that Ford seat bottom cushion just a little bit short for my height. Plenty of headroom as you'd expect in here. We have a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a relatively small range of motion. Jumping into the back seat, you will definitely notice that the Bronco has a little bit more room in the rear than the Wrangler. The Wrangler has slightly smaller dimensions in some key areas, but 
both vehicles are relatively comfortable in the four-door versions. This front seat's all the way back in its tracks, but have about an inch of legroom left. Rear passengers also get air vents back here. We get a 120-volt inverter port only. Uh, it's just 150 watts. Interesting twist. Even though the onboard inverter can do 3.6 kilowatts, it's not shared with the onboard power outlets. You have to use that plug-in bubble I showed you earlier. We also get some USB ports down here in the center console. Here's a closer look at that rear center console area. The power window switches are up here in that area. We then get the USB charge ports, that 120 volt outlet, and then the air vents for the rear. As before, there's a pretty large bar that runs right across the interior. You can see it contains the speakers right there. We also get map lights for the rear passengers. You can see this has the power soft top right up there. And then you notice the one downside to having side curtain airbags is that we do have this thicker area, thicker bar right here than we had before. Headroom is unchanged versus 2023, but room next to your head, between the head and the side of the vehicle, is actually a little bit lower because of those airbag modules. Looking around the cargo area, keep in mind that we are in the 4xE. Obviously, plenty of room for luggage back here. It's a nice and square cargo area, also pretty tall. We still have the separately opening glass, and we still have the spare tire back there on the door. Now, under the floor in the cargo area is where we find a storage area for the EVSC and that vehicle to load connectors. So this is a little bit different than we had in 2023. There's a interestingly shaped custom bag and you'll fit both boxes right there inside. And of course, because the windshield, the roof and the doors come off, there's a place to put all of that hardware right back there. And then it hangs out under lids that way it doesn't roll off anywhere. As we look around the interior, let me apologize in advance. It is very, very bright outside the desert. There's no shade to be had, so that makes filming this dark interior pretty challenging. Over here, we have the power controls for the power soft top. Over here, we have the telematics buttons, sliding sun visors for the driver and front passenger. This is a single layer soft top. So you can see right now I have some paper stuffed in there in order to help provide a little bit of insulation because it's pretty hot outside. The sun is very, very bright. Back here, we have reading lights for the driver and front passenger. We then have height adjustable shoulder belts and height adjustable headrests for the driver and front passenger. Rubicon, of course, embroidered on those front seat backs. The general seat design does not appear to be that much different than the non-powered seats, but the four-way lumbar support and the ability to adjust that seat bottom cushion definitely make them more comfortable. Moving over to the front doors, keep in mind this is a 4 by e Rubicon trim, so we have the blue accent stitching on that armrest right there, some soft touch materials on the upper section of the door, obviously hard plastics lower. There's a net down there for storing things. You will notice that because this cabin is narrower than the one in the Bronco, those seat switches are really close to the side of the door there. So people with larger hands might have a little bit of difficulty getting especially to that four-way lumbar support. Moving over to the dashboard, it's a slight change in design, more of a tweak really. Zoom in closer, you'll see the blue accent right next to that air vent the texturing going on for this stitched dashboard insert in the middle, soft touch components all the way around in this particular trim. There's a grab handle right there for your front passenger. We still have a fairly small glove compartment, kind of oddly shaped because the speaker is over there on the dash, logically because the doors come off, so no speakers on the doors. And that means that this would not be able to accommodate some of those larger tablet computers. Moving up to the top of the dashboard, we find a redesigned upper section of the dash. This is the new charge light area for the onboard 4xE battery charging system. The large touchscreen infotainment system in the middle of the dash is the big change for this interior. It is significantly larger than the outgoing Uconnect screen, although the instrument cluster remains essentially the same. It's this partial LCD design in the top trims. The bottom trim does not get that 7-inch LCD in the middle. This touchscreen is running the latest Uconnect 5 software, so very similar to the rest of the Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, etc. lineup. Factory navigation is optional. CarPlay will use the vast majority of the screen, but it always reserves the left side and the top portion of the screen for system functions. So easy access to things like climate control functions, some of the other system functions there, etc. We also, of course, in this 4xE model have some dedicated hybrid screens. So things like power flow, driving history, schedules, the e-save mode control, things like that. If you're worried about touch climate controls, fear not, there are still physical buttons right here in the center for everything. We also have keyless start in every model now, 12 volt power port down there, power window switches over here, the USB inputs for the infotainment system there, USB-C and USB-A, also an auxiliary input, 
and auxiliary switches for the vehicle. So if you want to add accessories, you can use those auxiliary switches there. Since this is the Rubicon model, we have a front and rear locker, off-road plus mode, and the sway bar disconnect feature. The shifter, it's a pretty traditional shifter. Of course, we have that Icon wheelies right there on top. We have the four-wheel drive controller over here, two high, four high auto, four high part-time, and four low. We then have some decently sized cup holders right in the middle and a place to dock your keys. So that way, hopefully, it doesn't fly out on the trail. Center console, definitely on the narrow side versus something like the Bronco, because again, this is a narrower cabin. And here, there's a two-stage storage area. You could put your winch controller in there if you want to. The steering wheel, that's basically the same as before. We have the controls for that multifunction LCD cluster on the left side, controls for the volume and track forward backward on the back of the steering wheel. Then on this side, we have the controls for the adaptive cruise control system. Speaking of adaptive cruise control, the radar sensor for that system is right here behind the rear view mirror. It's here because if you put an aftermarket bumper on your vehicle and the radar sensor was up front where we find it in most vehicles, it might interfere with the operation of the system. But if it's up here and you modify your bumper, the system is still going to function properly. If you fold down your windshield, there's actually a little plastic blank that you're supposed to put there so that way the radar is actually penetrating through the same amount of material as when it's going through the glass. Now, in case you're wondering what happens if you have that external power output box connected and someone inside tries to shift, well, there is actually a shift interlock, so I can't put it in drive to keep you from accidentally driving away with, of course, that plug involved. And when you unplug it, it'll automatically turn off the vehicle because, of course, it assumes it doesn't need to be running anymore. Instead of driving the Wrangler on-road, let's talk about how this drives off-road because the on-road driving dynamics really have not changed. Obviously, the 392 is going to be the fastest one, 0 to 60, followed by the plug-in hybrid, then the turbo, and then the V6. Which one is right for you will depend on what exactly you're after. I'm driving the 4xe out on this off-road course. I would actually say that this is not the best adapted of the drivetrains for an off-road course, however. And that's because of the 4xe's instant low-end torque. It can be advantageous in some situations, but sometimes on this course, especially in 4-low, it can feel just a little bit jumpy. Now, I would argue actually that you could probably do a lot of things in 4-high where it's not going to feel quite as jumpy. But let's get back to sort of the pros and cons of this versus its direct competitors in the segment, most notably the Bronco and something along the lines of the Toyota 4Runner. Versus the Bronco and the 4Runner, they have an independent front suspension. This has a solid axle up front. There are obviously pros and cons to either. Generally speaking, off-roaders tend to prefer a solid axle in the front, whereas an independent front suspension is going to give you better on-road driving dynamics. So if you had to pick a vehicle for the daily commute and off-road duty on the weekends, something like a Bronco might be a slightly better compromise. Of course, there's not going to be any plug-in hybrid system available, no V8 available, etc. But it is going to give you slightly better on-road driving dynamics. Meanwhile, this is going to be more rugged, more tuned for, more aggressive off-roading. Now, that said, you can get a solid front axle conversion kit for the Bronco. I know a few people that have done that. That definitely puts it in direct competition to this. So you do have a bit of a choice. Uh, as far as I know, there is no independent front suspension kit, however, for the Wrangler. The other thing you'll certainly notice out on a trail like this are the tidier dimensions of the Wrangler, especially if you're in the Wrangler two-door. That has a very short wheelbase. Now, it's not quite as small as Wrangler as used to be. It is still going to be a little bit tighter on some of these trails than that. Keep in mind, there is a Jeep Gladiator up there going on these same trails, so that should give you some idea that something larger will definitely fit, but it certainly makes a lot of tight maneuvers feel more comfortable when you're in a tidier vehicle, so you have that, uh, that ability there with this. Uh, let's go ahead and see what this uh, is like up here. This is definitely where you'll notice all that low-end torque from the 4xe system, but lots and lots and lots of it. So absolutely no problem climbing up this hill in electric mode. That is kind of the beauty of the 4xe system. Uh, you know, you have all that torque instantly available. Now, in order to get 470 pound-feet of torque maximum, the engine does have to be involved. So it's not just the electric motor that will get you that total. But you can get really high torque figures at low speeds in the 4xe system, which definitely makes it feel different than a regular gasoline engine. Again, if you want that more normative feel, you're going to want one of the other drivetrains, but this definitely has a solid feel. Now, today I've been able to drive not just this out on this same course, but also the 392 and the regular V6 engine. Also, the two-door model. Two-door model actually is a really, really nice feel for trails like this. It's definitely easy to place your wheels exactly where you want. But of course, that's not the most popular format of Wrangler. Most people are probably going to be getting 
the four door that I'm driving. Actually, relatively few Wranglers are sold, generally speaking, as two doors, which is why you can't get the plug-in hybrid system or the V8 engine or things like that in the two door model. Now again, as far as on-road driving dynamics goes, nothing has really changed with the Wrangler for 2024. So you can reference my other videos on that. The full float axle in the back in the Rubicon model doesn't have any impact on the driving nature of the Wrangler. Versus the 4Runner and what we expect the next generation 4Runner to be, again, we have the independent front suspension versus solid axle thing going on there. You will also notice that we don't have a front locker available. And that's probably the biggest difference between something like the 4Runner off-road and the Bronco is that you can get a front locker in the Bronco as well. Now, clearly there are times where you shouldn't use a front locker. So of course we have the stability and traction control system in here that's still gonna try and direct power across the front axle without using the locker. But then there are times where you really do want the center coupling locked and the rear locked and the front locked. In that mode, any of the Wranglers, of course, assuming they have both lockers, can send 100% of engine power and torque to a single wheel, whichever one might happen to have traction. I know in this vehicle I'm talking a lot about the 4xe and this video is theoretically about all Wranglers in general, uh, but the 4xe is the fastest growing engine in the lineup and again nearly half of them are going to have this drivetrain by the end of this year. The 4xe definitely has a different feel out on the road that you will have to get used to because when it's operating as a hybrid, there we go following his directions up here, when it's operating as a hybrid you will definitely notice the clutch engagement as it's switching between hybrid operation and electric only operation. And it's really amplified by the two-speed transfer case. So if you're in the low ratio mode, you will definitely notice that a bit more than in some of the other versions. So if you're in the low ratio mode, for instance, you will definitely notice those transitions more than if you're in four high or four auto, or obviously rear wheel drive just driving out on the road. So according to Jeep, the new Wrangler can tow up to 5,000 pounds when properly equipped, but keep in mind that properly equipped statement does not include the 392 engine or the plug-in hybrid. So you have to have the V6 or the 2-liter turbo without the plug-in hybrid. But then you could tow a trailer right like this Airstream. Let's be honest, 5,000 pounds of towing capability is not enormous. You'll find a similar tow rating in something like a Honda Pilot or a Kia Telluride, but they're not an off-road focused vehicle like the Wrangler. And if you haven't noticed this before, off-road vehicles tend to have lower payload and lower towing capabilities because of the suspension design and just the general vehicle design required for the kind of off-roading that the Wrangler can do. So in this case, a 5,000 pound tow rating is actually fairly impressive. Now you might be wondering, why is the tow rating on this V6 model higher than the 392 V8? It all has to do with the way the SAE test goes. There is a vehicle dynamics and vehicle stability component of the test, and the extra weight of the V8 engine up front, general vehicle dynamics just wasn't appropriate for that tow rating, and that's why they get the slightly lower tow rating. However, 5,000 pounds of towing capability with either the V6 or the 2-liter turbo is not a problem for either of those engines. This has enough grunt in order to actually do that, especially thanks to the lower gearing that we find in the Wrangler. And as far as vehicle stability goes, remember that this Wrangler is actually bigger than a Grand Cherokee from about 20 years ago, so vehicle stability with a 5,000-pound trailer on the back is not far off those older Grand Cherokee models. In case you're wondering, this vehicle has the accessory trailer brake controller. It's well integrated with the vehicle. It definitely works well with the electric brakes on this trailer. As far as general vehicle towing dynamics and towing feel goes, yes, the Wrangler is definitely moved around a little bit by this 5,000 pound trailer. Also, just general clearance wise, the Wrangler is relatively narrow because of its off-road mission. So it's actually a little bit difficult to see around that Airstream in the back. You really can't see a lot of what's going on immediately behind the vehicle. This is the kind of tow rig where I really wish this had a camera input for behind the trailer because it really needs it. We're on this uh, one lane road here and I really can't tell if someone's behind me wanting to pass or not. You'd have to constantly be looking in your mirror for an indication that someone's there and maybe they wanna get around. On the other hand, if you're looking to take one of those rugged off-road trailers a little bit further off the beaten path, we now have the heavy-duty suspension and the towing capability in the Wrangler to make that happen. If you're looking to get your hands on the new Wrangler, they should be on dealer lots right around the time that you're watching this video, wearing a base price of $31,895 for the Sport two-door trim with the V6 engine. If you want the four-door, that's going to be $35,895 starting, 
plus destination, of course. Now remember, the sport trim is certainly more basic than this Rubicon model right here. It's going to get the big LCD infotainment system, but a lot of the luxury gadgets and goodies that we find here are not going to be on the sport trim, and it's still going to have halogen headlights. If you want the 4xe plug-in hybrid system, so apparently 40% of you will fall into this bucket, then you're going to be paying at least $49,995, plus destination, minus any potential federal tax credits, because this does qualify for that plug-in hybrid tax treatment. Also, some state and local incentives in your area, depending on exactly where you live. So potentially this could be less expensive than a two liter turbo model. And that's probably one of the reasons it's been selling relatively well. Also, you could drive this in the carpool lane in California solo if you're interested. The Sahara trim starts at 47825 Obviously that wouldn't be the plug-in hybrid model, so you do have some choices to make. I really like the Sahara trim, but I'm not entirely clear whether I would get the plug-in hybrid. I might just stop at the regular two liter turbo. The Rubicon X trim, which is going to be the most off-road capable version with 35 inch tires, etc., over 12 inches of ground clearance, that's going to be at least $58,895. And the Rubicon 392, that is the most expensive, at a whopping $87,595 plus destination, plus available option packages, because there are so many different ways to configure your Wrangler, so many different factory options, dealer installed accessories, different tops available, etc., that you could easily start at a base price of $31,895 and end up in the $45,000 range if you're not careful. And that's probably why the Wrangler has been so popular as well, because there seems to be a Wrangler for everybody. The popularity of this model has meant that Jeep has so many different trims to choose from, four different drivetrain options, tons of different tops, etc. So it's a highly customizable vehicle, and that really adds to the, the allure and the experience of owning a Wrangler. Let me know what you think about everything down there in the comment section, and would you get a Wrangler or would you get a Bronco? I prefer the size and the format of the Wrangler. It is a little bit smaller than the Bronco in this four-door format. It also is a little bit better on tight trails, and the 392 sounds absolutely fantastic. Of course, you cannot get a hybrid system at all in the Bronco at the moment. Uh, rumor mill says that Ford might be working on one, but at the moment, that is exclusively Wrangler. We don't know what the future holds for the 4Runner or the Land Cruiser, but it's unlikely that they're going to have doors or windshields that come off. Definitely not going to be a convertible like this. So it's really a two-way race between this and the Bronco for this format of off-road vehicle. Some folks might want to toss in a Land Rover Defender into the mix. You can take its doors off, but its roof is never going to come off and its windshield is never going to fold down. It's definitely a different kind of vehicle than this. The body on frame, two-door, four-door thing, convertible, etc. This is exclusively Bronco and Wrangler territory.